Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity. So uh, innovation markets from a, an analyst perspective obviously can take many different facets and that uh, Euroconsult, uh, we're looking everywhere across the value chain, across all different types of space applications from launch to communication science. However, my uh, specialization is in uh, Earth observation, so to make life a little bit easier for myself, I think we'll, we'll have a look at some of the evolutions in that business and some of the uh, innovative approaches of which uh, some companies are, are putting forward. So I'm going to try and look at this from two perspectives. Uh, a, a little of how this, the market in terms of Earth observation has been evolving from the government context and also the response to that from, from the commercial side and also um, um, a little on uh, some of the uh, new uh, EO uh, space ventures which, uh, which uh, appear to be fast emerging. So just to give a, a snapshot of um, the Earth observation industry today as it is. So over the last uh, decade, we had uh, 133 satellites which were launched for uh, civil Earth observation and commercial purposes, another uh, 28 uh, meteorological ones. Uh, and these were launched from 33 countries. If we fast forward over to the next decade, we're expecting there to be quite a significant growth in the amount of supply. We expect there to be over 280 satellites to be launched prior to 2023. Uh, with a further uh, 70 uh, from, uh, from Neutrology. So we're expecting to see a, uh, um, quite a significant uh, increase in the uh, level of uh, Earth observation uh, data supply. And interestingly, about another uh, 10 countries or so are, are joining the fold and are expected to launch Earth observation capability. This in itself is actually creating an opportunity, which I'll just, just mention briefly and touch on for the, uh, for the manufacturing market. Uh, previously, uh, in the Earth observation uh, world, uh, NASA would uh, uh, go to Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman, uh, ESA would go to EADS or, or Thales Alenia. It was a relatively uh, closed market with leading space programs with a mature industrial base uh, supporting their industry. As we see new entrants come into the market, whether they be from uh, emerging countries uh, and emerging space programs, such as Nigeria, Algeria, Chile, and so on, they may need to partner with the manufacturing uh, base and we're seeing more export and we're seeing um, a lot more manufacturers try and target these areas and actually specifically as well for the uh, on the small sats side companies such as uh, Surrey Satellite have had uh, uh, quite a lot of success in that area others such as Satrek I we were expecting to follow. Certainly the vast majority of these satellites are being launched still by, by government programs. It, it's true we're seeing uh, more and more commercial satellites uh, being, uh, being launched, but the reality of it is today that about 85-90% of the satellites being launched for Earth observation are coming from um, uh, government. And total civil government investment totaled 9 billion in, in 2014. This is an all-time high for the Earth observation <coughs> sector and somewhat books the trend in global space uh, spending. That uh, 9 billion represents around about a 5% increase uh, on the previous year. At the same time, overall space spending has actually decreased by around about 5% as well. So certainly Earth observation is remaining a, a priority area for governments, uh, despite austerity hitting on some key programs such as NASA, JAXA, ESA, NOAA, NOAA and so on. The commercial data market um, totaled 1.5 billion in, in 2013. We're just right now at the process of updating their figures uh, for, uh, for 2014. Um, so we're, we're expecting about um, an 8% growth uh, from 2013 on to 2014. There was 0% growth actually into, leading into 2013, but this was predominantly a result of the reduced spending in, in US defense. Elsewhere, the markets were, were remaining uh, fairly uh, fairly robust. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the backdrop. Um, now I want you to take you back to some of our earlier research, pre me from about 25 years ago. This is the map of government space uh, spending in 1990. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the NASA, the Soviet Union represented the two uh, large uh, blocks there. Uh, just towards the end of the Cold War, Soviet spending now was uh, starting to uh, decrease. Uh, so in Europe, uh, led uh, predominantly by uh, Kness and the European Space Agency, spending was quite significant. 
Uh, Japan was about to go through a little bit of reorganization now to create NASDAQ, and Israel investments are just about started. There's no China on that map. There's uh, very there's no investment coming in from Latin America. There's uh, nothing from Africa. There's nothing from Middle East. Just as long as 25 years ago, this was a very closed group of countries and agencies which were investing into space. This is today, in 2014. This is um, all government investing into civil uh, space programs uh, globally. So no surprises, the United States re remains the most uh, significant uh, budget. Uh, Russia as well remains very significant, but China now investing over two and a half billion into space. Uh, European programs in uh, France, Germany, the UK, the European Union has increased its investment. But equally important to note is the myriad of the tiny little circles all the way around there from Kazakhstan and Ukraine to Bolivia to Mexico uh, into Algeria into Nigeria, South Africa. All of these countries have first looked to Earth observation um, to develop into some space systems. That's not to say for every single country looking to start investment into its space program that it will start with Earth observation. There are some exceptions, such as, uh, say, uh, Bolivia, um, uh, Angola, and so on, which through uh, um, export credit financing have been able to support the develop development of communication satellites. But by and large, the natural first step for these countries' involvement is, is Earth observation. So we expect there to be um, 40 plus countries to have launched Earth observation capabilities uh, by uh, 2023. Um, a further 20 or so are investing in the technology in terms of services development and so on. And 25% of the satellites um, prior to 2023 we expect to be launched are going to be first and second generation satellites from these emerging programs, commonly and often using uh, small uh, satellite uh, technology to be able to facilitate the development and also to be able to uh, train local engineers and uh, build a, a local industrial base. Certainly technology transfer is a very uh, key part of the emerging space programs in Earth observation to develop uh, into, uh, into, uh, uh, into the technology and to develop uh, know-how capacity, eventually leading to more uh, autonomous capabilities and even uh, to uh, initiate the development of a space program. Certainly, however, though, we shouldn't play down the role that the historical investors are playing. The leading R&D agencies in the US, the EU, Japan, um, will remain, and we expect to remain, the largest budget. Uh, the budgets to support a mature industrial base uh, with a focus on new systems development, that's not going to necessarily change. But certainly the fast developing programs um, elsewhere um, are certainly driving this growth. So one of the reasons why um, more governments are investing in Earth observation into, in addition to in, um, developing a, a local industrial capability is to gain some return on investment by trying to commercialize the data coming from um, the satellites. That's not to say that the satellites from these small sats or emerging programs are today making um, significant revenues. Indeed, that 2013 figure and 2014, there'll be no change. Uh, the digital globes, Airbus, MDAs of this world capture 75% of, of, of this um, data market. But we can see that you know, the, the, the data sales has been on quite a uh, trajectory. And certainly since the early consolidation in the industry around 2004-2005, when uh, that was when the US government um, decided to support only at the time uh, what became GOI and Digital Globe in terms of the next few contracts, and there was some consolidation. Since then, the, the, the market for commercial data has grown very strongly, predominantly driven by um, defense, particularly in the US, we saw a, a, quite a strong uptake in the amount of data which uh, which is being sold specifically to the NGA. But, so, but over the last three or four years or so, we've started to see stronger growth in enterprise markets, high single digit, uh, and certainly uh, non-defense markets outside of the US continue to grow strongly. So if you take out that bottom bar where it says US defense and you can see the drop off there, 
Indeed, that disguise is that we, we, we have around 9-10% growth on last year, if you do take out the US defense uh, side. And we remain positive as to how this industry is going to, do, going to develop. And I'm going to go a little bit, I think, off script now, try and pick up on the comments uh, earlier about are we shifting to data or are we shifting to information, products and information solutions. Um, this is the data market. <coughs> In 20, uh, 2014, we value the value-added services market at between two and two and a half billion in, in addition to this. So if you add that all together, we have what we believe is around about a uh, uh, four and a half, five billion uh, geospatial data value added services uh, market. Is there a place for data sales? Yes, absolutely. Um, certain clientele and certain customers will always prefer to have the data rather than the information product and to be able to do that work internally. And the biggest case in point is defense and that is, is, is a major driver for the industry. The enterprise markets, however, represent somewhat of a, of a different problem. Um, we, we could see uh, data being used more increasingly as part of a component into a, a much more wider product. It's true that, and has been always, that the, the farmer uh, doesn't want a SAR data. He, he wants the information in his hand as to where he needs to irrigate his land or where he needs to uh, uh, fertilize and, and so on. We're getting to the point now with some enabling technologies, uh, handheld um, uh, constellation systems, which um, reduce temporal uh, revisits and uh, at, at a much lower cost, where this can become um, more of a reality. And certain companies are already exploring into this area, such as, uh, such as Skybox and uh, actually Digital Globe last year, uh, acquired a company called Spatial Energy, which was doing something very similar for the uh, oil and gas markets. You've been able to say when there, where there's been subsidence or when there's been activity and so on, and this information can be sent directly to, to their handheld. So data has a lot of value, but in certain areas, we may see the Earth observation market start to resemble other satellite applications, such as GPS or even a direct-to-home TV, where you sometimes forget that it's the satellite supporting the technology as you do with the GPS in your car and Earth observation just becomes one part of, uh, of, of that solution. Now certainly in terms of, um, um, to go back on script, certainly in terms of regional markets, um, North America and Europe have started to slow a little um, framework around by austerity and governments reduced to spending. But outside of the two, those two largest markets, we're seeing quite significant um, growth uh, across uh, Russia, CAS, Latin America, the Middle East, all showing 20% plus growth over the last uh, five years, um, whether that be to support image intelligence, whether that to support wider economic growth in terms of supporting infrastructure and engineering projects, and so on. So in order to be able to reach out to these communities, we've seen a uh, proliferation of distribution agreements um, from outside operators acting inside the countries. And it's important to note that as global as the space industry is, and, and in nature what Earth observation is, you still need to be local to serve a lot of clients, particularly the civil government side. The private sector may be somewhat more uh, agnostic, but partnering and developing a reseller network and distribution networks has been a, a focus of the leading uh, commercial uh, actors over the last uh, five, six years, and we've seen quite a strong proliferation of these types of agreements, particularly into the, 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 the countries and regions which I just mentioned previously. Now, most of the commercial supply at the moment is coming from North American and European companies, so it's not particularly a great surprise to see that that's where the most number of agreements are. However, Latin America, Middle East, Southeast Asia, Asia, I've started to see more and more of these being put in place. So this, this um, um, perhaps I should just uh, to show you how, how the importance of this. If, if we take that $1.5 billion data market, 65% um, of it today is, is defense. Uh, the vast majority of it is defense. Uh, civil private sector, roughly similar, similar sizes, civil to the larger. About 12 to 17 percent of that business passes through um, distribution and distribution networks. That's not a hugely significant percentage, obviously, when compared to the overall, the overall figures, 
But in terms of being able to reach out to the civil markets, that's key. So through the distribution agreements, around about 50% of the business has to pass through, passes through the distribution. That's actually the majority of the civil government business uh, um, uh, globally is required to go through those routes. And it's no real surprise that uh, governments have a mandate to support industry locally, and therefore, if they want value-added services or products, they will go first to a local value-added company. And it's in the interest of the operating company, therefore, to be partnering with that company so their data is utilised within those within those solutions. Defence, on the other hand, um, companies such as Digital Globe, Airbus, have, have uh, started their a few years ago started their rollout to their direct access uh, receiving stations. Uh, the Digital Globe Direct Access Program directs defence users allowing for encryption, high security data and so on has proved to be uh, very successful and that seems to be the, the, the main route of entry for, uh, to access defence users. So it really depends on where the end user comes from as to the different approaches to actually receive data and services. <laughs> Interestingly, you know, this, this creates somewhat of, of, of a paradox uh, within the industry. More and more governments are looking to invest in earth observation solutions so they have their own supply. At the same time, more commercial players are trying to go into those same countries so they can develop and sell their same product. So therefore, should national supply be viewed as a threat to commercial business? Well, not exactly. And we, we ran a survey last year on this, uh, interviewing the, um, um, numerous data distributors uh, across the globe. And it was felt that the, the, the existence of a national program was overall viewed as a positive. It increased the overall data availability and starts to create ecosystems for services development and so on. So they might, those end users may first be using data from their own nation programs or even free data through Landsat or so on. But once that community is grown and developed, it then tends to shift to want something a bit more. And that may be something commercial or something more improved. So certainly the one does not seem to be impacting the other. Um, the one thing that was more of a concern was uh, um, uh, how eventually will the attitudes towards low cost and free data have for, for, for the business. So at the moment that's not considered to be, to be an issue, but uh, obviously if uh, free data starts slipping much below 10 meters, then it can start to, there can be some attrition obviously in, 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 the, commercial, in the commercial market. And perhaps to illustrate, um, we did a focus on, on Latin America. Um, this is two five-year periods at the top there um, of a cumulative global investment into, into Earth observation. You see the, little, the sliver there, which is, which is Latin America. So in global context, it's, it's only 2%. But that's going to go, go to 3%. That's, we're going to see almost a doubling of the in investment of uh, Latin American governments into their space programs with the objective of developing satellite capacity. And we're expecting, uh, over the last decade, uh, half a dozen satellites or so were, were launched from Latin America. We're expecting 25 um, to be launched over the, over the next decade. So on the continent, there is, there's going to be a quite a significant uh, local supply. However, at the same time, the market continues to grow strongly, 17% uh, over the uh, last uh, five years, um, with uh, applications supporting defense infrastructure engineering. Brazil happens to be the largest market, totaling 33%. However, we still expect that to be 10% average growth out to 2024, despite the increasing supply in the market to top 350 million. We still view it as one a very dynamic region, despite this uh, um, increasing national supply. <clears throat> so to change tack a little, and then let's have a, let's have a look at some of the uh, further commercial um, systems which, which are coming up. So a little word of warning, the, the two charts on the right here are all application areas. This is not just Earth observation inside here. We have satellite communications and we also have science and technology type missions. Last year, in 2014 alone, 195 small sats were, were launched. That's, that's the most ever. Now admittedly, 100 of those were, were, were the CubeSats for Planet, for, for Planet Labs. But it, it represents somewhat of a, of a, of a milestone in the, uh, in the small sats world to get uh, to get that high. Um, market we expect to um, grow and remain and develop quite strongly, and particularly for Earth observation, we expect in the next five years, forty percent of all small sats um, to um, 
have an earth observation uh, focus. And certainly in terms of how we view the forecast, you know, small sats is a, a very tricky market to to try and uh, uh, to try and um, to try and assess. It does the satellite development times don't have the same lag as, as, as large emissions, and obviously there's there's a lot of missions out there at the moment. Some will succeed, some will not. So we just looked at the trajectories of what the small sats market could look like in a high and low case scenario of the 2.3 and 2.6 billion. The 2.3 billion is actually on, on the current trajectory uh, with, uh, with, with planned single missions, um, which are, we expect to be in the pipeline. The high scenario is if just one of the larger constellations which are being put forward will be launched. We're not saying which one it would be, but if, if one. If more develop and launch, then, then obviously that figure can be, can be much greater. So what does the new space effect have in the commercial EO business? Essentially, it's, it's, it's increasing the imagery data flow with daily coverage with greater granularity and change detection. It doesn't make much difference what the type of application is. Essentially, it's the greater granularity in the change detection, which can see markets in, such as market intelligence, business intelligence, which um, um, Scott mentioned this morning. But from an investor standpoint, it's also interesting that it shifts the price point from high capex intensive business into a lower cost approach with greater emphasis put on the post-processing. That we couldn't have done a few years ago. Uh, now it's at the point where we can get data down to less than 10 meter CE90 from a, from a very low cost platform. And that's quite an enabling technology which might not necessarily fulfill all defense needs. There's still going to be a place for the high precision systems, but certainly that's an enabling technology for, 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 for developing into the markets. And this as well gives you an idea of where some of this investment is coming from. Um, this is just, I won't go through all of this in, in, in detail. What I find most interesting about this is 10 years ago, I believe the only venture capital which was coming into the Earth observation business was a small amount which went into what was then Rapidi. Uh, 10 years forward and we have um, a dozen or so missions on there. And for every, every mission on there, you can bet there's going to be another one that yes, yet we do not know. Interestingly, most of the story at the minute on that left is, is US. It's a very, uh, new, we talk of new space environment, but certainly at the moment it's quite US centric in terms of the supply, uh, with the exception of Satellogic, which is Argentinian and uh, North Star based in Montreal. Uh, and also the, the investment and the partners coming into that, with the, the exception I think, of uh, Mitsui, which is a Japanese investment holdings company. Um, most of that money is also coming from um, the US. And more and more from Silicon Valley and the, and the input that they have. Do we expect all these missions to develop and emerge and realize that's probably uh, a little unlikely, but certainly the environment and the ecology has, uh, has uh, started to, uh, to, to change. So uh, just to conclude, um, if we exclude the, the large constellations which are coming on, we, we expect 60, 60 satellites to be already offering commercial data by the end of 2016. It was about half that, about four or five years ago. There's, there's a lot of choice uh, coming out there. We're expecting the commercial offerings to start to, uh, to, start to vary, in part based around this low capex model, but at the same time other solutions are being put forward. Um, hyperspectral is on the verge of uh, being able to uh, match uh, the revisit with the ground resolution, and there's a, there's a few missions coming out in that area. Environment monitoring meteorology, uh, obviously a lot of pressure has been put on the US with some of the overspending uh, and some of the issues there on the, uh, on the NOAA program, so there's been a push there. Um, certainly we wouldn't expect um, I think there's three or four GPSRO missions which are pushing forward at the moment. We wouldn't expect all of those to succeed, but certainly it changes the, 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 the emphasis of the commercial offering away from what was pure very high resolution data resolution data to, to something more to something else but the industry however is still driven by demand so if there's no requirement for it then then the chances of success are lower and there's a few things that uh, we're keeping an eye on there certainly the energy markets has taken a hit around about 80 percent of the energy applications were uh, um, in the exploration phase, that's low now. We expect that to shift to more of the monitoring midstream phase, and that's going to mean that companies are going to have to adopt. The market business intelligence, which Scott was referring to, we, we expect to also develop uh, quite uh, strongly. I won't go too much back on that. 
However, and we shouldn't take it away from it at the moment, defense is still a key, key driver for the commercial side. Maybe not necessarily for the lower cost constellations, but in terms of commercial supply, uh, very few countries operate uh, uh, satellites capable of uh, uh, you know, defense grade and image intelligence. So we, we do expect that to remain as, as a key. Line. And thank you. Certainly, what can be collected and, and what is, is and, and the companies how they promote what can be collected and what is actually sold. Yes, there's, there's a definite disparity. Yeah. I guess the second part of my question is like, some, some of the, the new entrants are looking at you know, IGSD, some are looking at multi spectral or super spectral, some are looking at wide area coverage, high temporal mm -hmm. revisit rate. Um, I got the impression from what you presented that if you had to bet on who's got it right, it's I wonder where you think the sweet spot in this market is going to be in the next five months. I, yeah, I have my theories. I, I think if you can match a high temporal with good ground resolution, it doesn't need to be 30 centimeter world view 3 type technology. But I think a, a daily revisit at one meter resolution, what Skybox was putting forward, was actually not a bad idea. And actually, Skybox now has been acquired by Google, and much of that's probably going to go to the Google, um, Google Earth engine and so on. So. I reckon there's a space there. So. <laughs> One more question. Yeah. yeah, I'm just curious, since you have a lot of the numbers up there, would there be any predictions from that when the uh, line for the, the private sector part of the business would intersect and exceed the government sector? I think we're somewhere off that now. We, we do have a figure now on how much the private sector is putting into the business. It's it's a little bit more sporadic and it's measured in the hundreds of millions rather than the billions. I suspect purely because we're still supporting the R&D science driven Earth observation missions that it will be some time if we ever get to the point where private sector will overtake the investment. I, I don't think it's quite the same as the satellite communications business. In that regard, there's always going to be the role for government in supporting the the R the R and D environment monitoring uh, uh, type systems, for which the commercial sector could augment. But I don't know if it's ever going to fully take that over. And I think that by that measure, I don't think the the if we get one billion investment into the um, Earth observation business in one year, that would be a fantastic well, start. Doesn't have a lot of it depend on how far the you know, private sector pushes the box? Yes. It's true, and they're in the appropriations right now. I think for, for NOAA, making uh, um, uh, funds available to support commercial input into that, but there's a lot of resistance coming back the other way as well. So, yeah, I'm thinking particularly that now it's on constellation thing, which is one of those high resolution and very low cost. Hmm. Well, I think the client labs business model is probably going to be something like a service level agreement with the government. But the government has to be in a position to then appropriate the funds to support that. And that's still in the balance. Personally, I hope that will, but it's a little bit wide up here. 